As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Mm. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. For then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. When you see all of these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. I looked, and there before me was a pale voice. Rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify Him. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Then there came severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since the human race has been on Earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, fell on people. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. A couple days ago was the 150th anniversary of the greatest solar storm ever to belch out and hit the earth. Back then, didn't do much. Made the northern lights sparkle plenty and, and made telegraph wires burn a little bit. But today, if we were hit by that same size solar storm, the entire electrical power grid would be knocked out. Of the United States? Of the United States, at least. 
according to the National Academy of Sciences, not just me, Governor, the National Academy of Sciences, which is the closest thing we have to a Supreme Court, a scientific opinion in this world, up to 130 million people would be without electricity for months or years. We would lose basic security, emergency telecommunications, fresh water, because the pumps are electric, and we are vulnerable. And you're predicting that that is going to happen at what point in time? 2012. Lawrence Joseph is not exaggerating. Incredibly, NASA's own studies are in line with ancient predictions. This is the report. It includes opinions from experts around the world. It concludes that solar storms could lead to a cascade of catastrophe. Well, if this is such a threat then, and it's only a couple years away, why isn't it more on the radar screen? When the National Academy of Sciences report came out, it did get a little bit of buzz and a little bit of press, but it's even more than that. The next month, NASA discovered something that makes the why now more urgent than ever. And that is? A squadron of five NASA satellites called Themis, T-H-E-M-I-S, flew through a hole in the Earth's magnetic field that goes from the pole to the equator. Why is that important? Because the Earth's magnetic field protects us from blasts from the sun. Its sure. job is to repel them and spin the blasts around so they don't hit the surface of the Earth. Sure. Except that this group of satellites found, much to everyone's surprise, that there's this giant hole in the Earth's magnetic field. It's like the shields are down, Scotty. They're supposed to be up, but they're down. Again, no exaggeration. December 2008. NASA reports its Themis spacecraft have discovered a giant breach in the magnetosphere, ten times larger than any thought to exist. And that's the Earth situation right now? The shields are down? It is. One hundred million people will die between now and the 20th of February next year. One hundred million people. That's staggering. If you do the mathematics, that comes out to about three people every second are passing into eternity. That fast souls are going out of this world. In the last year, we've now seen three major earthquakes in the Pacific, the most powerful, of course, this one in Japan over the weekend, but also in Chile and New Zealand. That has a lot of experts concerned that one could now be triggered on our own Pacific coast. We want to talk about that now with Dr. Michio Kaku, who's back with us again. And the real con one of the concerns is that you'd get about a nine-point earthquake up here around the Aleutian Islands. That's right. This is not Hollywood anymore. It's actually happened. The second largest earthquake on recorded history off the coast of Alaska. And it could send a tidal wave 15 feet tall that could hit Los Angeles. And there's another concern of one, though, right off the Pacific coast. That's right. In 1812, we had another earthquake. And again, the potential here is that within a few minutes to five hours, a wall of water 15 feet tall could hit Los Angeles and go two to three miles inland. So let's dig into more what that would mean for Los Angeles, what kind of destruction we would see if there were an earthquake first. Well, let's say we have an 8.0 earthquake, smaller than the one that hit Japan. According to but the right U.S. right on the San Andreas Fault? Right on the San Andreas Fault. And according to the U.S. Geological Survey, the devastation would be catastrophic. Downtown Los Angeles flattened. 40% could withstand an 8.0 earthquake, but 15% of tall buildings are at risk and could in fact collapse. So does that mean that, that we're not as well prepared as the Japanese were, say, in Tokyo? Exactly. The Japanese are the world's best in terms of preparing for earthquakes. And look what happened to Kobe. Look what happened to Sendai. And look at the casualties in Los Angeles. 3,000 dead, five, up, up to 50,000 injured, and the fires, six to 7,000 raging fires out of control. Remember that in San Francisco in 1906, mm -hmm. my grandfather witnessed it. Fires caused more damage than the earthquake itself. And then, of course, there's also the concern of a tsunami and what that would mean for, uh, for the various areas around Los Angeles, starting with L.A. Harbor. That's right. L.A. Harbor would perhaps experience the worst damage in case of a tsunami. Again, a wall of water 15 feet tall going 
two to three miles inland. Santa Monica, believe it or not, would not experience as much damage because of the geometry, but Orange County, Newport Beach, Seal Beach, Huntington Beach would also sustain massive Boy, flooding. Deep it goes in there. Okay. That's right. So we're talking about whole areas being flooded, and some of these areas are very wealthy and they're very vulnerable. I wouldn't buy beachfront property there. Okay, well, Dr. Kaku, thanks very much. A sobering uh, prediction there. And we ask you what you think, if America's ready for the disaster or not, an incredible 92% of you said no. They have consistently published, and we can verify that they have, sufficient information. I'm going to be sending you links to tons of stuff so you'll have a little easier way of you know, going about it, that can verify that they've been warning about very specific things. Now, I'll tell you this. There is a warning, a specific warning on two events that they will not give the dates for because, again, this is not hand-holding. It's like, here's the information. And here is the information. There will be a 9.0 earthquake off the coast of Portland, Oregon at some point, and they won't say when, that will run at 9.0 for five straight minutes. Oh, it will five minutes of 9.0, that's going to wipe out an awful lot. Well, you're on it. It's a sea quake, but nonetheless, that's very powerful. It will generate a tsunami, tsunami. Yeah. that is going to slam that part of the West Coast. It will then produce another earthquake and tsunami. It will be devastating to that area and to people in that area. They have said, and now, this was told to Meyer several years ago, about two years prior, documented, verifiable, prior to our scientists now coming up with the same conclusion. They have also said, the, uh, I think it's called El Cumbre Volcano in the Canary Islands, mm -hmm. is going to, it, it is going to erupt for sure unless uh, there is a way we could prevent some of the damage, but it will erupt, and when it does, one trillion tons of mass are going to go into the sea suddenly, generating uh, a, a, a tidal wave tsunami, not only that will rush up the coast of Spain, Portugal, and France, but which will cream the entire eastern seaboard of the United States and penetrate up to 12 kilometers inland and potentially take out 20 million human lives. They will not tell us when they will simply tell us that this event will happen. Now, let's take that specific example then of the volcano on the Canary Islands. Uh, I don't understand why they wouldn't want to tell us when, because having this information in inverted commas, what the hell are we going to do with it? We can't stop a volcano erupting, can we? Right. What we can do, and what they said we should do with it, especially here, is that the, it, they said it is the responsibility of your government and your scientists to prepare routes for evacuation and means okay. of uh, getting people out because when that goes, when they sign that that's going, that will give seven to eight hours or so of time, I guess it is, before that wave would cross the Atlantic. So if we have a warning, folks, it's now time for plan B. Here we go. All right, well, let's, we, we've, our time is, is just about out, and I, I, I could do another hour with you really, really easily, probably another three hours with you really easily, Michael. I've enjoyed this, but huh, Billy Meyer gets told this information. Uh, shouldn't the powers that be, the beings who told him this, this is really seismic stuff, quite literally. 20 million people you're talking about perishing at some date we don't know. Why didn't they go to the United Nations with this? You know, cut out the middleman, deal direct. That's the bit I don't understand. You don't have very long to answer this question, and I'm sorry for that. I'll give you the answer this way. In 1979, the play are an authorized contact with the Carter administration of the United States. A letter was drafted by Billy Meyer, given to the lead investigators, and presented to people in the Carter administration. The offer was turned down. Well, that's no big surprise. A letter, that's no good as if they need to appear to Jimmy Carter himself. Well, you have to know that the CIA has been monitoring from day one. And the part of this is the story that hopefully we can do another... How do you know that, by the way? Because the lead investigator retired Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens, U.S. Air Force, and Lee and Britt Elders, who were the skeptic owners of Intercept, a high-level uh, electro counter-espionage uh, company, who went with Wendell Stevens to Switzerland to start the investigation of the Meyer case in 78 to prevent him from being taken in by a hoax. And all three of them ultimately came away not only knowing that this was no hoax, but having to account to the CIA 
each trip in and out of London on their way to Zurich, and we have this uh, in publicly recorded, you know, presentation when we'll see this everything. You just pulled a thread on a sweater here, my friend. In Los Angeles, that was Billy Myers representative Michael Horn. Now, I don't expect you to buy into any of that. I don't know what to make of it. It is either, as I said, the biggest hoax there has ever been or something truly amazing. And I really don't know which. And it's not my business to make that judgment right now. It's your business to judge about it. An idea has suggested itself to me in the last couple of minutes, just as I'm Buddy, the sun, it's the source of all life, and it could mean the end of life as we know it. NASA did a study, and its findings are now out. We're not talking about global warming. A brand new government study on the very real destruct uh, destructive threat of solar storms. Check it out. The surface of the sun, a roiling mass of plasma and charged uh, high energy particles. As we move to the launch pad, we can show exactly what we mean. Escaping the surface of the sun and traveling through space to areas down here on Earth. Now this giant fireball, if that ball hit the Earth and its magnetic shield, it would be devastating. I want to show you New York City at night. Times Square drove through here at 8 o'clock last night. Streets are empty. But the electric power grid would be wiped out by the current. Lights and computers, transportation, hospitals, all would go down. The study warns it would be a disaster, far worse than anything we have seen before. The menace of these sunstorms poses a bigger threat to more high-tech and advanced countries like the U.S. Everything from our sewage systems to our Wall Street banks operate with our power grid. And a game-changing solar storm that could hit at any time. So how worried should we be? Sounds like we should be. Michio Kaku is an astrophysicist and author of The Physics of the Impossible. Sir, good morning to you. Welcome back here. Glad to be on your show. Uh, now, w what I'm reading here scares me to death. Should I be that way? That's right. We're talking about a potential Katrina from outer space. Uh, Katrina caused about $100 billion in property damage. And unless we begin to make efforts now to reinforce our satellites and power grid, we could have something maybe 10 times bigger than Katrina because we're talking about the loss of all electricity and all satellite activity. We'd be thrown a hundred years back into the past. Michio, has this happened before? In 1859, we had a humongous storm that wiped out telegraph poles, and we tried to then estimate what kind of power could do that. And we now realize that we are very young in the space age. If something like the 1859 storm hit again, it would literally paralyze all the United States, not just for a day or an hour, but for months to years. Our transformers would short circuit and burn out. Satellites would be fried to a crisp. And the sun, however, has these storms every 11 years. Every 11 years, the magnetic field flips. But in 2012, we do expect perhaps, perhaps another big one. Well, we have never before in our history in human history for that matter, relied so much on technology as we do today. And that's part of what they found in the study because we rely so much on our ability to communicate through our computers that they would all go down, which would handicap not just New York, but really the eastern half of the United States. That's what the study finds, which would be far worse than the blackout of New York from four years ago, Michio. That's right. Those blackouts only last for a few hours to a day. But if you start to short circuit all the transformers and blow out the satellites and fry the communications grid, then you're talking about knocking out uh, the United States uh, for months before we can get enough rescue crews and repairmen to handle not just one city, but hundreds of cities around the United States. You know, Michio, sometimes you come on here and you sound like the doctor of doom and gloom. Does this, well, th th I, does something like this keep you up at night? Um, it does, and I think with Katrina, you know, engineers knew that Katrina could happen, but they did nothing because they said that it's not going to happen while I'm around. Well, now we learn the lesson. You have to prepare for things, especially when you know that at some point it's inevitable that we're going to have another big one, like we had back in 1859, except this time we're totally dependent on electricity. Michio, thank you. Hope to see you in person next time. We'll take you on okay. the phone if we can. Michio Kaku, thank you for your time today. 1859. I mean, we're going back 150 years on that, Megan. Now he's wondering about 2012. Watch for this story.
When it comes to natural disasters, 2010 was the deadliest in decades. A quarter million people died in super typhoons, landslides, heat waves, earthquakes. In our countdown to 2011, we want to look at the science behind it all and what it means for next year. And Dr. Michio Kaku, physics professor at City University of New York and author of the upcoming book, Physics of the Future, is with us. We're looking forward to your book that's coming out mm -hmm. early next year. Thank you. FEMA says it was the worst ever, that they responded to more emergencies than they ever have before. How bad was it? Well, look at the Chilean earthquake. You realize that it was so big it actually rocked the planet Earth. The axis of the Earth shifted three inches as a consequence of that 8.8 .8 earthquake. The day is no longer 24 hours. It's been shortened by one microsecond. Oh, wow. That's how big that earthquake was. And before that earthquake, we had the earthquake at the beginning of the year in Haiti that killed more than 200,000 people. Displaced three million people. Right, so when you, when you look ahead to, to next year, you said there are five major cities that should be concerned. In our lifetime, we could very well see one of these cities destroyed. We will actually see this happen, perhaps. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Mexico City, Tehran in Iran. In our lifetimes, we could see one of the great metropolitan areas destroyed. And remember Completely destroyed? Leveled. Uh, remember that 100, 200 years ago, many of our cities were fishing villages. Mm -hmm. And our populations have expanded into areas that are seismically volatile. So it's not that Mother Nature is angry at us. It's not that the Earth is having its revenge on us. We're being hit with this triple whammy because we are creating mega cities where there used to be fishing villages. Mm -hmm. Technology is going into areas where we never had technology before. Like the volcano that rocked uh, Iceland, um, Benjamin Franklin actually witnessed a previous eruption in around 1785. But there were no transatlantic flights in the time of Benjamin Franklin. Which, right, which got a lot of attention because a lot of flights had to be diverted because of that volcano. And there right. was another one this fall in, in Indonesia. So looking ahead and closer to home, what do you see on that front? Well, the good news is that the Earth is not angry at us. The bad news is, however, we're going to see more of these events simply because we have more technology to monitor these things. Our megacities are encroaching upon Mother Nature in areas that didn't exist a few hundred years ago. So we're going to actually see uh, more, more of this kind of seismic, seismic activity, more volcanoes, more swings in the weather. What about Old Faithful? Well, yeah, believe it or not, underneath uh, Yellowstone is a gigantic super volcano. It has enough energy, packing enough energy to actually blow most of North America apart. Uh, we're talking about flooding North America with uh, volcanic ash, destroying huge chunks of, of the continent of North America. Mm. However, the last time it erupted was several hundred thousand years ago. Okay, that's something <laughs> to keep in mind. Scientists right. always love talking about the sun. So tell us a little bit more what you see going forward. Well, we have the sunspot cycles every 11 years. That's when the North Pole and the South Pole flip on the sun, creating a shock wave. And in 1859, we had the mother of all solar temper tantrums. In 1859, the Carrington event uh, rocked the Earth with electromagnetic radiation. In Cuba, you could read the newspaper at night with the shining of the wow. aurora borealis in Cuba at night. If we had another Carrington event, which happened 150 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, it would cause about $2 trillion in property damage. Uh, we physicists have went to Congress and told them we have to reinforce our power stations, reinforce our satellites. We could be wiped out with simultaneous blackouts in 100 cities. But the bottom line is here, you're saying we don't need to go running for the hills in the, in the new year. Yeah, some people think, oh my God, we're heading for 2012. I mean, uh, let's the quit our... that we saw. Right, let's quit our day job. Let's sell the house. Uh, don't sell the house. Okay. <laughs> don't quit your day job yet. Uh, we're going to see January 2013. Okay, it's so nice. no problem there. We're going to be here. Dr. Kaku, thank you.